Rolling. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you, Jeremy. We're back. Thank you, thank you. Everybody pressing and accounted for. Don't want to be missing any speakers. Recon. I want to see four hands going up right now. Recon. <laughs> well, before I, I, I begin the second session, bring our lovely Toastmaster up here. A little housekeeping. A couple of things right after the meeting is adjourned. All competitors, all participants, pictures. Don't leave. We're going to take pictures. All right? Would appreciate, gentlemen, would appreciate if you could help me stack the chairs no more than four high. That's all I ask. No more than four high, gentlemen. And last one out the door. Doesn't get a price. First one out the door doesn't get a price. So figure that one out. All right. Are we ready, ma'am? Yes. All right. Welcome back, and let me bring up to the lectern our Madam Toastmaster, Jennifer McAllister. during the break, please make sure that it's turned off. Yeah, just turn it off. And once the contest begins, the sergeant at arms, who I want to introduce, Laura Kronsky and Joyce Zambrano. You can please stand. Joyce is upstairs. downstairs and Joyce will be securing the doors to the outside. <clears throat> Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the international <coughs> speech contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it is determined that all ballots have been collected. Please check to see again if you have any cell phones or other devices or iPads or anything that might make a noise like that. Thank you. Here is the speaking order for the International Speech Contest. Again, you may use your agenda paper that has the names of the contestants. First speaker is Seth Colley. Second speaker will be Gary Crisp. Third speaker is Art Budelier. And our fourth speaker will be Steve Ippolito. So that's Art, no, Seth, Gary, Art, and Steve. So we will proceed now with the International Speech Contest. There will be, again, one minute of silence between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please signal me with the green light when one minute is up, or just have the green light. After all the contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballots. So now we will begin the International Speech Contest. Seth Colley, let it go. Let it go, Seth Colley. <coughs> Let it go, let it go. Now, before you start running for the exit, Cut. I'm not going to sing the rest of the song. Cut. I don't know the words. Cut. And I'm not going to invite anybody outside to help me build a snowman. <laughs> but if there's something in your life that's weighing you down, that's troubling you, I encourage you this evening to let it go. Use these three words as your start to a better life. Now it sounds pretty simple, and if I'm in your situation, I'd say, nah, whatever. But think about it. Is there something weighing you down? Perhaps 
you need to thin out your house. You have too much stuff and clutter is strangling you. Or maybe you didn't complete those New Year's resolutions. You wanted to quit smoking or you wanted to go to the gym more. Well, let it go. Get your butt up and go. Or maybe it's something more <coughs> destructive in your life. Now, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but if there's something weighting you down, think about it don't need it, it's not helping, and it's not letting you live the life you should be. Mm -hmm. Now after 22 years of being married, I found myself a victim of divorce. And you know what happened? I was one pissed off individual. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask for it, I didn't want it, but I sure got it. And you know what it did to me? Is it made me angry. It filled me with hate, rage, any other adjective an emotion you think you could think of towards my ex-wife. And then it made me an angry individual. That that anger and that hate bled into my life. And it started to ruin things. It started to affect the way I worked and the way I communicated with other people. It started to affect relationships. It started to affect friends not wanting to be around me family members not wanting me at their home because I was mad. And then what was happening was that that anger over those not being able to have those friends and connections and not being successful at work started to morph into something even worse, despair and depression. Now I stand in front of you today as a survivor of depression. And you may not think that that's a big deal. Oh, hey, Seth, you said let it go at the beginning of your speech. Well, yeah, it's easier said than done. Because that anger and hate that I had turned into depression. And I couldn't get off that merry-go-round. Because every morning I'd wake up mad at my ex-wife for ruining my life. And all I wanted to do was pick up that phone and yell as hard as I could, I hate you. You ruined my life. And then you throw in, not only did I get divorced, I got replaced. I wasn't even out of the house two months, and she moved another guy in. And we were married 22 years. You want to talk about another slap in the face to add to depression and despair. So I had all this great, wonderful life going on. And I had never heard the Disney song at this point. But I was wallowing in my own despair and depression. I know I needed to move on, because my ex-wife obviously had, but seriously, women in the crowd, do you want to date an angry, depressed man? <coughs> I didn't have much luck with that. I'd get a date or two, but that would be gone. And then my anger over that caused more despair and depression. So again, it was a vicious cycle. And just when things couldn't get any worse, I got kicked out of my parents' house. No, I wasn't living there. But my attitude and the way I was, I was told, you can't come back until you change. Think about that. The people who raised you ban you from their home. I knew I needed to change, but that just compounded. <coughs> Before you think all was for naught, there was one woman who might be crazy for all I know, but I had gone out with her a couple of times, and she thought there might be something worth saving in me. And she looked at me and said, you're a good man. You're just in a bad situation. And if this relationship is going any further, you've got to make some changes. I'm sitting there going, what are you talking about? And she said, well, you're going to go to church with me. <laughs> and you're going to join a Bible study. And we're going to get you out of this funk. And I said, okay, whatever. I didn't realize how far I had fallen. Because most of you who know me, I am a pretty funny guy. And that humor was not there. But I went. In this Bible study, I started learning things like forgiveness and grace and letting go of things in your past 
or people that have wronged you, that are pulling you down. But I still didn't really get the concept. I was hearing it, but I didn't get it. And then I had my aha moment, or as I've heard in therapy, my rock bottom. Now, I wasn't addicted, but I pretty much had a needle in my arm and a bottle to my lid. And that was when my mother called and said, your father's ill, he's got 48 hours to live, I want you to come home. So I came home. I started dealing with things you have to do in 48 hours, but I didn't have the address book. My ex-wife did. So I had to call her. And the thing that I wanted to do the most was just cuss her out, right? But I didn't. And I realized she was a human being on that phone call. She helped me. She gave me the information. She was kind. And at the end of the call, I said three words to her. But it wasn't the words I wanted to for a long time. It was, I forgive you. And then I followed that up with, I have no room in my heart anymore to hate you. And I realized at that moment, I started to let it go. And I moved from the dark into the light. And my life improved. My parents saw my efforts and welcomed me back in the home. In fact, the silver lining of the story is my father has actually lived Believe it or not, after 60 days in the hospital, he's given 48 hours to live, pulled through. And our relationship is even better than I can even imagine. And then that woman, who I thought was nuts at the time, who didn't give up on me, saw the changes I made, and our relationship flourished. And I still think she's crazy, because just a couple months ago, we got married. <laughs> <laughs> now, depression is something I live with, and I deal with it every day. And I'm not going to sing the rest of the song, but I still might go out and build that snowman mountain. One minute has been called. Now we may have our second international speech contestant, Gary Christ. Thank God I'm a Toastmaster. Thank God I'm a Toastmaster, Gary Christ. Toastmasters, contest chair, and distinguished guest. I've got to tell you, I'm one weird dude. <laughs> I tell you this because I really think I can change the world. For instance, in 1989, I thought I could solve the homeless problem. So I invented a way to take old tires and build houses that homeless people could live in. And it worked. And then again in 19, or 2002, I decided that, oh no, I need some help. So I thought I'd go run for governor. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> the reason it didn't work is because I was miserable at giving speeches. So bad that my friend Margaret suggested that I become a Toastmaster. Obviously, I didn't become your governor. But I thank God I became a Toastmaster. Now, why am I standing here thanking God that I became a Toastmaster? I'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> Since joining Fox Valley, I've had the great opportunity of making a dozen missions trips to one of the poorest places on earth. 
Cambodia. The pastor of my church invited me there to install septic systems at orphanages. <laughs> I couldn't believe the poverty. The dusty, broken roads were so bad, far, far worse than anything I've ever been on. And not one piece of machinery doing any kind of repair. And the multitude of amputated beggars that would be desperately lifting their hands when they'd see a white-skinned person. And that was just the beginning. Please understand that Cambodia used to be a very advanced and prosperous nation, rich in natural resources, even considered the pearl of Southeast Asia. What brought Cambodia to ruin could be described in one word, insanity. In 1975, a very wicked dictator took control. His vision was to enslave the people to grow rice. Then he would trade this rice for weapons. But the only way he could con maintain control was to have all of the religious and political leaders, all of the teachers and administrators arrested and killed. Maybe you've heard of the killing field. Pol Pot stole the bright hope and future of Cambodia and replaced it with a nightmare. A nightmare of millions upon millions upon millions of landmines that are still in the ground today. In 2005, I was in Cambodia, my fifth trip there. I was standing on a corner. And I was observing this horribly scarred man on a cart that he would propel with his hands because he had no legs. But he was calling out to the tourists in a booming voice, welcome to Cambodia, welcome. And as I watch him, my heart just sank because these rich tourists would just walk by him. They wouldn't even look at him. My dad left something in my heart. He said something, Somebody greets you, you look them square in the eye, extend a firm handshake, show them respect. So I did something I think my dad would do. I reached over to him, shook his hand, and after a few words, I said, let's go get something to eat. After a prayer and a bowl of chicken soup, this man, Savanta, told me his story. In 1990, he was a captain in the Cambodian army, fighting the Pol Pot army. His dream was to become a general, until he stepped on a landmine, a very powerful landmine. It blew off both of his legs, sent shrapnel into his hands and to his face. He spent eight months in a hospital. When he was released, he only had one option to provide for his family, to be a beggar. I told Savanta, I've got this weird idea to build a machine to get rid of these landmines. He was so happy. Two years later, I presented to Savanta this machine, cobbled together from old tractors and farm equipment, ready for testing in the minefield. I called it the Peace Hammer. When I come back to America, I am so thankful to be in this lovely, blessed country. And I can't wait to give speeches about Cambodia. Over the years, I've given dozens of speeches. And one day, I received an email from his Hostmaster magazine asking if they could do an article about the Peace Hammer. You know what? Being a weird inventor is not easy. <laughs> but when that article came out, I was so encouraged. It opened so many doors. When I'd show that magazine to machine shops, they would welcome me in and help in incredible ways. And today, I am more hopeful than ever because there's good people from Toastmasters, some right here in this room today, that are helping me improve this invention to become a machine that I believe will save lives and limbs, not just in Cambodia, but around the world. Now, do you see why I thank God I became a Toastmaster? Friends, I believe there's many of us out here with weird ideas to help make the world a better place. And I want to encourage you. I suggest that you think of being a Toastmaster as being like a battery in your car. As for me, I like to think about 
tractors and large earth moving equipment. <laughs> These powerful, complex machines have the potential of doing so much good, thousands <laughs> of times more than I can do myself. But they all rely on a battery to make that spark to get the whole thing working. Of course, a battery needs to be charged up and installed properly, or else it does no good. So I'm challenging you, Toastmasters, get charged up. Connect your positive to positive, ground out the negative, and be that spark that changes the world. been called. Now for our third international speech contestant, Art Bender. Chump. Chump. Art Bender. It is true that integrity alone will not make you a leader. But without integrity, you will never be a leader. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, that quote by Zig Ziglar calls us all to act with integrity. We should all strive to be a person that people can trust. Who, to be a person people can trust and who always does the right thing, even in the face of adversity. To me, that is integrity, facing adversity. Keeping your integrity in your job and your personal life is hard. Let me give you an example. You may work at a place where people practice bad behaviors, such as not holding poor performers accountable, people undermining other people's efforts to advance their own careers, even financial fraud and corruption. All kinds of bad things can happen in the workplace. And it's hard to go against that current. Think of the workplace as a river with all the bad behavior flowing in one direction. Call it the peer pressure river. When you work in that workplace, you're in that river. When you step in the river, the current is so strong it sweeps you away. <laughs> if you don't like what's going on in that river, that organization, you have to go against the flow. When you get in that river and try to change the bad behavior, it is almost impossible and it is exhausting. When you're in that environment, you either have to go with the flow or get out. That means you leave that organization. But let's say you work in a better place where people have integrity and they treat each other fairly. You can practice your integrity and keep the company strong and make it even better. How do you do that? You work hard. You volunteer to help others. You be the one with the good ideas. When people see your leadership, they will follow suit. And then the river will flow in the direction that you lead it. People generally lose their integrity bit by bit, not all at once. 
Let me give you an example. You've probably seen these cement posts in the parking lot. They're about three feet tall, about five inches in diameter. They're put there as a barrier to show you where to stop. If you take a big, heavy sledgehammer and hit that cement post, chunk, a little chunk of cement will fly off. You weaken that post a little bit. Take your sledgehammer and hit it again, chunk, another chunk of cement flies off. You weaken the structural integrity a little bit more. Hit it again, chunk, now the post is starting to crack. Keep on hitting it. Chunk. 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 Eventually, that cement post is a pile of cement dust. It's useless. Our integrity <coughs> is like that cement post. In the beginning, it's strong and sturdy. But there are sledgehammers everywhere. When you're in that peer pressure river, you're getting hammered. And every hit you take, you lose a little bit more of your integrity. Chunk, chunk, chunk. But there is something you can do. When you take that cement post and put a steel liner around it and over the top, you can hit that post all day long and it won't chunk because it is fortified against any attack. You can do the same thing with your integrity. You can fortify your integrity by building your own steel wall. How do you do that? You plan ahead. You think about the bad things that will happen in an organization and you decide ahead of time what would be the right thing to do. Then when adversity strikes, you're mentally prepared your defenses are strong. You don't have to worry about, should I or shouldn't I do this? You know the right thing to do, and you do it. And the best thing is, the more times you do the right thing, the stronger your integrity becomes. This is how you show leadership. Keeping your integrity in your personal life is a challenge, too. Let's say that you want to lose weight. But you give in to temptation and you eat a big chocolate chip cookie. Chunk! <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you eat a large pizza. Everybody say it with me. Chunk! <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you eat a large pizza and then have the cookie for dessert. Say it with me twice. <laughs> chunk! <laughs> chunk! <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, your integrity is chunking apart and your body is chunking up. So don't chunk. Chunking is bad, whether you're losing or gaining. For Toastmasters, leadership is one of our main objectives. And integrity is a big part of leadership. Keep practicing your good values and helping others, and you will do them a great service. Way down the line, years from now, your friends will still remember fondly the help and the inspiration you gave them. For me, when I'm gone, <coughs> way, way down the line, I want to be remembered as a man of integrity. How do you want people to remember you? Madam Toastmaster.
one minute has been called. And now for our fourth and final international speech contestant, Steve Hippolito. Oh, say can you see. Oh, yeah. Oh, say can you see, Steve Hippolito. <laughs> speaks to the history, traditions, and struggles of a people or of an individual. Back in the day when I used to go to the discotheques, there was a, the, the dance floor would be barren until this song by Gloria Gaynor came out. And then the floodgates of women would just open up. But there were no men allowed on that dance floor. And the song was, I Will Survive. And it spoke about a relationship that had gone wrong and these women would dance on the floor together, and that was their anthem about how they survived the perils of the dysfunctional relationship. Mr. Con or Mrs. Mrs. Chair, Mrs. Chairmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, our national anthem begins with, Oh say can you see, by the dawn's early light. The night before, there was a battle where Great Britain was trying to reclaim territory that they thought was theirs, or believed or felt that was theirs. While this newly formed nation defended their homeland. Last Tuesday, I walked into work, expecting to put in a full day of work, and I was notified that my services were no longer necessary. That was a war within me that began. But you know what? The next morning I woke up, by the dawn's early light, and I realized it's a new day, it's a new beginning, it's a new opportunity. What so proudly we hail is the twilight's last gleam. There's a certain sense of pride when you step out of that moment of darkness and into light to know that there's hope, there's a bright future ahead of you. Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous night over the rampart we watched were so gallantly streaming? Our flag contains the colors red, white, and blue, and those colors mean something, and that's interwoven into the fabric of this country. Red stands for hardiness and valor. White stands for innocence and purity, and blue stands for courage perseverance, standing in the face of the howling winds of adversity, bending, but never breaking. The fabric of the colors of my character include pride, respect, integrity, discipline, execution. That's an acronym for pride, and I learned that when I played high school football. And that was our motto. In the locker room hung a sign that said, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. As the rockets red glare and bombs were bursting in midair, as our flag was gallantly waving, those bombs were intended to break the spirit of this nation and take down the flag and for all that it stood for. Yet something unintended happened that night. It lit up the sky like a 4th of July grand finale celebration. And it gave proof through the night, though tattered and torn, our flag was still there. What was intended for destruction actually gave light to something positive. When I was dismissed from this job, it was the sixth one in as many years. So you want to talk about being bombarded and, and the, the, the glare of despair and bombs of doubt blown off in my head? But you know what? As you can see with your own eyes, though tattered and torn, I'm still here. Okay? I'm still here. Well, say does that star-spangled banner ever yet wave. For the land of the free and the home of the brave, I have the freedom to choose 
how I look at my circumstances. There's a saying that says, when life deals you lemons, make lemonade. My father was a businessman, and he used to say, when life deals you lemons, open up a lemonade stand. It's all about how you look at things. It's all about perspective. So rather than wallowing in self-pity, I chose to pick up the phone and reach out to some of the folks in my network. And I did. And I had a job interview today, and it went well. In the home of the brave, bravery is to stand in the face of adversity with courage and not waver. I will not waver or bend in spite of the uncertainty of my future. When I went to grade school, I learned that our nation is a nation of, or a melting pot of many people from around the world. Regardless of what your heritage is, or where you come from, ask yourself, what is my anthem? What are the colors of my flag? How do you stand up in the face of adversity? So when you wake up in the morning and a new day begins and the music starts, stand tall, stand proud, and sing loud. Let your flag wave and let your true colors show and be true to who you are. This is Toastmaster.
all the letter collectors. Thank you. And now for the fun part. I will get to interview the contestants. So with that in mind, I would like the Table Topics contestants to come forward. And since we have one of the contestants who is also in the International Speech Contest, I'll just ask you that one time. Or I can have another go at it with the International Speech. But the Table Topics contestants, please come forward. October 2009, so it's been five years. So you're a member of GE Healthcare and? Cary Grove Toastmasters. Cary Grove Toastmasters. So you're a member of two clubs. Yes. Very nice. And you're representing today? Today I'm representing Cary Grove. Cary Grove Toastmasters, because that's a club for everyone. And what is your Toastmasters educational role? I am Distinguished Toastmaster, DTM. <laughs> means do the manuals. It doesn't mean don't time me, it means you keep doing the manuals. But we're going to time you anyway, sorry. I noticed that you said that you're a senior technical writer. That is such a neat job to tie in with Toastmasters because what you do is use words to communicate. Have you found that you learn a lot from Toastmasters that you can apply to your technical writing? Actually, not so much. Okay. Technical writing is very disciplined. And you've got to write whatever the product is about, 
and you have to please all of your customers, your audience, and all of those hard-working professionals that use the manuals you write. Whereas in Toastmasters, it's a blank slate, and you can write all kinds of creative speeches, and you can just run free. So I was a little more open-ended. Yes, a lot more. <laughs> but, but there's some benefits by being able to communicate with words. Yes, uh, organizing your material and also being able to constantly write and revise your content and be able to make changes on the fly is huge. So the editing ability from tech writing and the editing ability for speeches is wonderful. Okay, great. I want to thank you for being a participant. Union for a number of years, so it was very convenient to go there on a lunch hour. And then they decided to uh, outsource the work that we were doing, which was technical writing, luckily. And uh, so I found myself searching again for <coughs> employment and ended up, after about four and a half months, getting a proposal writing position, which I'd done proposal writing as well, at a wellness company in downtown Chicago. And during that time, I was looking for something closer to home that could be my Toastmasters home. And I found Crystal Lake Toastmasters. You do like Toastmasters home. Yes. yes. And Paul is a member of my home club. Paul, you are, of course, representing Crystal Lake Toastmasters Club. And what is your educational path? Uh, Toastmasters. I have a CC and a CL. Very good. for notable accomplishments in very, very tiny print, participated in District 30 Evaluation Contest Fall 2013. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just share with us the joy of, or describe that experience? I wish there weren't as many as eight people in that contest. <laughs> it's, it's very, very tense. You've got hundreds, hundreds of people in the room. And you're given so limited time to come up with some coherent thoughts about evaluating someone who is speaking in front of all these people and presumably has been given that opportunity because they're a decent speaker. So it's, it's tense. Uh, you're trying to do it maybe without notes, if you can, because you think maybe that'll give you an edge. It doesn't always. Some people have won that contest using notes, but it was it was a great experience. It was early on a Saturday morning, <laughs> but it's not that early for me because I get up at about five every morning during the week anyhow to get to train in Chicago. So, so I'm here to tense, wake up early, but it was a great time. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed your participating in this contest. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think you 
enjoyed your competing today, and I thank you very much for doing so. Then not only the table topics, but also the interactions and contests. studied leadership and integrity and things like that. And I work in a kind of environment where all these different things that can go wrong, do go wrong, and a lot of different levels of, of people I get to work with. In the federal government, it's, you really have a lot of opportunity <coughs> to work with senior managers, even though I'm not at that level, because I do audits. And so when I walk in there and do an audit, I have a lot of authority, no matter what level I am. So I'm arguing with all kinds of people, lawyers, all kinds of people. So it's a real learning experience on the job. Yes, it is. It's very interesting. Well, thank you for competing today. systems. When I went to see my first orphanage, I looked around, I, my pastor took me out there, I go, where's the orphanage? I just see this straw pot, basically, well, this is the orphanage. They didn't have even a toilet. So I told him, I said, Pastor, you need a septic system out here. He goes, yeah. 
can you put one in? I said, yeah. He goes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I learned my first words in Cambodia, other than hello and thank you, was, was at me in, which means they don't have. You try to get a shovel, no shovel. You try to get septic stones, they don't even know what a septic is. So I had to invent something. And I'll never forget because I was working it, the ground was so hard, and I was sweating so bad, I'm thinking, what am I doing here? And then four people come walking up big Americans, and there were two of them were doctors. And I, I, they asked me what I was doing, I told them putting septics in, they were so happy to hear that somebody's trying to fix the problem of the sanitation issue. Because they, they said they were so tired of just handing out antibiotics, antibiotics to the sick kids. Because what's needed is what you're doing. Fix the septic problems, and then that will... So how, how does this tie into D-mine Cambodia? Well, on the, 13th, on, on the 13th septic, yeah. there was a landmine. And that's what got me thinking. Wow. I could have stepped on that thing. And that's that what got me thinking about right. I could have been a guy in a wheelchair. So and you started thinking you didn't want that to happen, and you're you started this website to bring attention to this cause. And well, later on, yeah. But I, I, I felt that there had to be some simple way to just drop a big heavy weight from a distance on a mine. Instead of going there and digging them up like they were doing it now, they dig them up. It's, it's really harrowing to see that. And so, yeah, that led in, I, I had to help get that spark going to ignite other people to help work. So we got a website going. Tim's working on a video for uh, Kickstarter. <coughs> we hope to raise $120,000. So things are really rolling yeah. now that you've spent all that time. <coughs> yes. It's going to be an instant success after sure. all that time. Yeah. If I had one thing to say more, it took 20 years for Toastmasters to jump to actually become something that they could replicate. And uh, now there's 15,000 clubs in 126 countries growing at 7.3% a year. At that rate, everyone will be a Toastmaster and then there will be world peace. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we have 
We have some winners. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, here at Toastmasters, we have a tradition. And that tradition, at least in the nut of woods I live in, is a drum roll. Yeah. All right? So for the Northwest Area Tabletop, second place, that goes to Mr. E.K. Slayton Seth. if the following person chooses not to accept or cannot make it. And that person, the one and only, the technical writer, Gina Coates. Unfortunately, we did have one disqualification due to time. However, that doesn't mean that that was not a great speech. So keep on working, wherever it was. Drum roll for second place, runner up. The one that's always swimming against the current, Mark Bellier. National Speech Contest winner. <clears throat> Moving on to the next level. I am very proud to announce the winner, Gary Chris. <laughs> Sergeant at Arms, the 
his life. Uh, <clears throat> Anthony's lovely wife, Laura. What are we doing? <laughs> my wife, Beth, she is definitely, I have a heart, always behind the scenes. And she's not here, but she's still upstairs. Joyce St. Brown. And to the one I can always, always count on when I need help in the preparation of goodies and such, a very dear friend of mine, Joan Wall. As a reminder, contestants, winners, participants, we have a guest. And that guest is Gary's mom. Oh. And guests, thank you for coming. All our dignitaries, this meeting is adjourned.